I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed. Welcome back once again to Bible Talks. My name is Chris Kramer with the Northside Church of Christ in Russellville, Kentucky. We thank you for joining us this week. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We meet uh, Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. And then we offer our Bible Talks program here on WRUS every Saturday morning, as you know. But also in our YouTube channel, we have a video uh, version of it that you can go to and refer back to from time to time. Well, last week we uh, left off in our study uh, that we have been engaging in regarding the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is something that we come together and remember that Jesus died on the cross for the remission of our sins. And he said, this do, in other words, partake of these element, emblems, the bread, which represents his body, the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. And he says, this do in remembrance of me. So we remember the sacrificial lamb of Jesus Christ. We remember our relationship with him and all the things that Jesus suffered in order to bring us salvation, to bring us peace and joy and happiness. And so last week, uh, we talked about the manner in which we partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, you know, we talked about the worthiness. Uh, as a Christian, we are to be qualified and we are to partake in a worthy manner. Uh, we are to have our hearts in the right place, that it's not about us. It's about, it's about Jesus deserving. I'll never be worthy enough, you might say, of all that the Lord's done for us. Uh, but Jesus certainly is, and he's worthy to remember. And so we come before him, we correct our ways, and we examine ourselves as to whether we're in the faith, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Uh, last week, Brother Nick uh, finished our study with uh, Luke chapter 18 when we looked at the um, example of the Pharisee and the tax collector who went and prayed to God. And though the Pharisee technically never said anything wrong, he had the wrong attitude. And I guess you could say that he was wrong in comparing himself to the tax collector. When the tax collector looked at himself and asked the Lord for mercy, uh, the Pharisee who looked at himself as being so righteous went through the checklist uh, like we might dangerously do today. Hey, I came and I gave. Well, I sang a few songs. I prayed. I listened to that long gospel lesson and uh, I drank the juice and ate the bread, you know? And if that's the way that we look, at what our worship embodies and entails, that we have missed the point. Those things are necessary, they're important to do, but we need to, as we'll talk about in our lesson today, discern the body of Christ. This brings us to our reading, uh, where we left off last week from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So we'd like to begin our reading today from verses 29 through the end of the chapter, and we're gonna look at that discernment of the Lord's body and look at, of course, uh, the spiritual judgment uh, upon us. So, Nick, if you want to begin uh, with verse 29 and carry us through. Uh, verse 29, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. We talked last week about the, the worthy manner and uh, the right examination in the heart and the state of, of our spirituality that we should have in coming together to give praise to God. And so when we think about discerning, though, when we talk about the Lord's body, what are we talking about? In this context, we're, we're obviously talking about Jesus dying on the cross, so there's that element of his body. Jesus dying on the cross, the element of his blood. But when it says the Lord's body like this, what is the overall you know, understanding as to what this term means. Are we still talking about the actual body of Jesus that hung upon the cross, or is it something more? Um, well, what does Chris, the church often refer to in Scripture? Well, the church is often referred to as the body, and and it was an epiphany moment one time. I was uh, 
uh, looking at this verse and, and it was, I was trying to really wrap my mind around what does it mean to discern the Lord's body? Mm-hmm. And, and then it dawned on me and within like the next chapter in chapter 12 of first Corinthians, he gives the answer of what the Lord's body is. And he says, verse 12, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And so it it was like an epiphany, like, duh, like obvious now (laughs) that you see it. When we abuse that fellowship that we're supposed to have, and whether it's by division or whether it's by as you looked at in other chapters of like causing a stumbling block for our brethren, when we do not have the proper love and affection for those that we consider uh, Christians and brethren, then we begin to disrupt the internal fabric of what makes us Christians. And we begin to uh, bring judgment upon ourselves, as he's saying here, that if we do not eat and drink in a, in a worthy manner, we eat and drink judgment. And so when we turn and abuse the Lord's Supper uh, by obviously not practicing what is authorized, but as in the context here, not even looking at our brethren correctly, it causes our worship to be in vain. It causes the Lord's Supper to not even be the Lord's Supper anymore. It is just a, it's just a matter of eating some cracker and drinking some juice. You know, it's just going to go into the body and be eliminated, as, as Jesus would have said. And, and so we lose that special connection. We lose the, the, uh, the spiritual essence of what the Lord's Supper is. And because the Lord's Supper is supposed to remind us of our fellowship in Christ. It's supposed to remind us that by myself, I was unworthy. And now I have the righteousness of Christ. I have the forgiveness of Christ. And it doesn't matter if I'm a rich man or a poor man. It doesn't matter if I'm white or black. It doesn't matter if I'm a man or a woman. Jesus Christ is the great equalizer. And I have been made uh, free from my sin, just like everybody else has who has been baptized into Christ. And so why, when I'm taking the Lord's Supper, would I still look down upon somebody else that is partiality and partiality is a sin and that's exactly what these brethren here were dealing with and why paul writes to them you know there were certain abuses that they had made toward the lord's supper and that was one of them uh that they were in essence judging each other in regard to uh, i guess you might just say their status and uh i've seen that in our world today certain religious groups who only partake of the Lord's Supper a few times a year. I've, I've, I've had some Bible studies about this subject with them, and I'm amazed that they place priority on individuals. Uh, one man came to me once in his particular church. Uh, he says, you know, I've been chosen to partake of the Lord's Supper this week. And I'm like, what? What, is, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> and, um, you know, they're placing more emphasis upon their worthiness and their deservedness versus Christ's worthiness. He deserves our honor. He deserves our respect. But yet, as much as this may be an individual act of obedience, it is something that's done congregationally. It's something that's done to emphasize our fellowship. And really, if we go back to 1 Corinthians 10 and look at the connection that uh, Paul makes in that previous chapter about coming together in what we, we call communion, Uh, A lot of times the Lord's Supper is called communion. And this is exactly why, Uh, because it is a communion, one, with Jesus Christ. If you remember, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he told his apostles that I will will, uh, partake of this with you in the kingdom. So the kingdom exists. It is the church. Here we are after his death, um, you know, 1980-something years after his death. And each time we partake, we are partaking together establishing our fellowship with each other, and of course, our fellowship with Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16, it says, the cup of blessing with which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? 
And though for we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. So there you, you've got really kind of a, you know, some double teaching here. You're, you're talking about, obviously, our act of obedience coming to, to, to the Lord in the, you know, in the worship through the Lord's Supper. But what that represents on a greater scale, it represents that we are one bread in one body. Uh, we are partaking of the one bread, which Jesus says in John chapter 6, was him. He is the bread of life. And here's the ironic thing when you go back to John and his um, recording of Jesus preaching about being the bread of life. That's when people started to leave him. They started leaving because they couldn't see the symbolic connection in regard to the fact that he was the, the manna. And that was kind of the basis of which he took this conversation. He was the manna that came from heaven to supply spiritual life to the people. And so they're thinking, well, how can we eat and drink him? I, I don't get that. And he's not necessarily talking about the Lord's Supper in this passage, but he is talking about who he is as that which sustains spiritual life. And the sad thing about it is, is, uh, you know, they complained about him. And he, it says here in verse 66, this is John chapter 6. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And, uh, you know, Jesus looked at his own apostles and said, do you also want to go away? And I love the words of Peter. I've got to read those in verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. But you start talking about partaking of that bread, people just didn't get it. And they still don't seem to get it today. That Jesus is the bread of life. Now, that being said, we have the physical representation of, of his body, which is the bread, the unleavened bread. And these are elements, uh, uh, you could say, that follow certain guidelines of the Passover from the Old Testament. Uh, the Lord's Supper is not our New Testament Passover. We don't want to confuse those terms. Uh, we just want to make it very clear that we're talking about fellowship uh, between us as brethren. So what are we really talking about here? We're talking about a matter of spiritual judgment. And as we said in our lesson last week, we've got to examine ourselves. But then verse 31 goes right around and says, if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. I think he's showing here that if we just left matters to our own hands, we wouldn't see a problem with how we partake. The Corinthians wouldn't see a problem with how they were partaking the Lord's Supper. And I believe that they, one of their abuses was they were making it like a common meal, you know, like a potluck, like we might say, you know, let's get together and, uh, you know, let, let's, let's have our meal. And, you know, they may call it fellowship as many people do today. But I think this lesson goes into so many different directions because if we are not discerning the body of Christ, the Lord's body, which is the church, that we are not respecting one another. We are not, as uh, you mentioned earlier, we've quoted from 1 Corinthians 10, verse 24, that we need to seek one another's well-being. And so the goal here is, um, what am I thinking of? How am I examining myself? Yes, but also, how am I encouraging my brother? How are we taking this moment to reflect together on the love that Christ had for us to die upon the cross for the remission of our sins? It's not something I can do by myself. It's something that we only see biblical example of brethren coming together to partake of the bread and of the fruit of the vine. And so there should be great significance to that. We talked about that a bit last week. What are some of your thoughts? A thought going through my mind is how these brethren here in 1 Corinthians uh, verse uh, chapter 11, they're so concerned about filling their physical bodies mm -hmm. with food but yet they are neglecting the spiritual body of christ and so where's their focus where's their emphasis it's on the carnal it's on the flesh and and it just highlights what he says there in verse 32 but when we are judged we are chastened by the lord that we may not be condemned with the world if we allow the chastening of the Lord to continue to mold us and make us and encourage us to, to move forward in our faith in Christ, uh, in the Spirit, in the Father, then 
you know, we're going to see the distinction between worldliness and, and uh, spiritualness. And this worldliness is a massive problem with the Corinthians because when they were trying to follow after a certain teacher, well, I'm of Paul, well, I'm of Apollos, well, I'm of Cephas, he, Paul says, you're thinking carnally, <laughs> you know, you're not mm -hmm. thinking spiritually. And here again, what are they doing? They are, they are having these factions. Some people are getting full and getting drunk, not necessarily intoxicated, but filled with drink. And there are people in their, in their midst, their brethren, who are going hungry. Yeah. And, and there's no, uh, no compassion. You know, they're only consumed about satisfying their own gluttony yeah. and, and not taking care of their brethren or not discerning the Lord's body and what does it truly mean. And one of the ways we kind of technically, you know, distance ourselves from things like that is you'll notice most of the time we, we partake of a very small piece of bread, you know, very uh, minimal amount of, of juice. And uh, God never placed emphasis upon how much was to be consumed. But yet we probably get most of our understanding of that through what Paul says here to the brethren, because he says, when it comes to mealtime, you have houses to eat and drink in. The Lord's Supper isn't to be made into a meal. There's a time and a place for that. In fact, he says that twice. That's how important that point was to be made. He says it here in uh, chapter 11 and verse 22. Then he says it basically again in verse 34. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. You're not coming here because of physical hunger. You're coming together because of spiritual hunger. Jesus said that. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And so from the very beginning of this discussion in verse 17, he says, you come together not for the better, but for the worse. We can't just have the attitude, well, hey, at least we were there. How many times have you heard somebody say, at least I dot, dot, dot. At least I partook the Lord's Supper. You know, at least I gave you know, a few dollars. At least I sang a few notes. That, this is exactly the opposite of that. That's the attitude that you see in Malachi's day. You go back and read the last uh, book in the Old Testament, and you're going to see people who worshiped, but yet God said, you're not worshiping good enough. You're robbing from me. You're not bringing the best to me. You are abusing the table of the Lord. And that's how God looked at their worship. So you can't just say, well, you know, at, le at least I'm taking it. Our lessons the past three weeks have centered around why we're doing this as Christians coming together. It is not a haphazard thing, nor something that you just do hoping that you'll get into God's good graces. We need to be in God's good graces as we partake of this thing, which is why the everything talked about here, I think, is the pre-state of taking the Lord's Supper, examining oneself, praying, blessing. All these things happen before the partaking of these things so that we might be in the right frame of mind, the right spiritual state, and that we understand we are accountable to God. You read a few moments ago, Nick, uh, from verse 32, that we are chastened by the Lord. We are disciplined by him. We are instructed by him. Discipline has various forms, one of those forms being uh, a standard by which we live by. And of course, he goes on to say that we won't be condemned with the world. This is something that sanctifies us. One of the words in the Bible you'll find quite often is sanctified. And that means to be separate, to be set apart. And as Christians, we are set apart from the world, put into the special relationship with God. And uh, we get to enjoy the blessings and the privileges of that. And partaking of the Lord's Supper is one of those things. So it should be a joyous occasion. But then he makes the comparison. And this is how I'll phrase this. Never abuse the physical parameters of our worship. That's what these brethren had done. And sometimes we may be in danger of that today. They had made the partaking of the Lord's Supper as a common meal. And like I said, Paul said twice, you have homes to eat in. Now we could go a step further and understand that uh, we're not talking about enjoying this meal as though, you know, the taste of the bread matters or the taste of the juice or how much is involved. It's not about filling our bellies. 
It's about filling our hearts and our spiritual nature. And that comes with partaking of it, but that partaking of it comes with what are we thinking about? How are we examining ourselves? Do you think about Jesus, his, his time there before and on the cross and what he had to endure? And those are some elements that we might talk about in a, in a future study in just reminding us what Jesus went through so we can have this privilege of, of partaking of the Lord's Supper. And a couple of things I might focus on, then you can kind of close out our program, Nick, um, as we are quickly running out of time. But we never want to abuse the necessity of the physical things that we must do, you know, the bread, the juice. Also, coming together, you know, in a building. Uh, we use our building for giving praise, honor, and glory to God. It's not there to add social halls or kitchens to. Again, these passages can show that that wasn't why they were to come together. In singing, we do not go beyond scripture and uh, add instruments of mechanical nature to our singing. We give praise to God through song. Uh, the use of the Lord's money. Uh, we do not create man-made institutions uh, to give the Lord's money to. There is a very set standard by which God has deemed uh, the money within the church to be used. All these things are based upon the same argument. There's the physical and there's the spiritual. What are we focusing upon? And we can't do something physical and just say, well, it's the thought that counts and so I'm doing this spiritually. What does the authority of scripture teach us? Because the authority of scripture gives us example, lest we come together for judgment. And so as we've been saying throughout the course of these studies, it is a serious act of worship, and we need to do it according to God's design. Jesus was the one who instituted this thing, and we need to carry it out as Jesus determined. I'll leave this verse with you. In verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul reminds us by saying, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, meaning this is by the Lord's command. This is by the Lord's authority. Well, Nick, we're out of time. Uh, any last thoughts before we close? It was just a, a reflection on that we are to be a spiritual people and we are to rise above the carnal flesh. And Paul might have said, what, do you not have houses to eat and drink? And he's not condoning these bad behaviors at home. <laughs> some people might try to draw some conclusions on that. Uh, he's just saying, don't be doing these things at church. There's no there's no place for that when you're gathered together. We are to be a spiritual people. And, and so great reminder of that. And there is a time and place for certain things. But when we are gathered together, we need to remember the fellowship that we have in Christ through his blood, through his sacrifice. And the Lord's Supper reminds us of that. And he gave his life willingly for us. And if you're not a Christian, we implore you to become one. How can we help you? Please contact us, the Northside Church of Christ at hotmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Nick would love to hear from you in the Morgantown area at Christian Home. And we just want to do what we can to you know, point you in the right direction. Worship with us tomorrow. We hope that you see within us a desire to preach and practice the truth. And we hope that you'll come together with us to see our desire to remember that the Lord died for our sins and the great honor and the great um, uh, privilege that it is in this serious matter of worship. So please be with us tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock as we give praise to God. Have a wonderful day and may God be with you. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name.